Okay, any questions from last time? I think this is where we left off. Is that correct? Yeah. Fantastic. Um, nothing at all? No questions whatsoever? I don't know who was mean and scheduled me for the last block of today and then for the first block of tomorrow. So you're going to get a nice sandwiching of pharmacology. And you also get two more on Thursday. So that's going to be just, well, I mean, to be honest, like it would be better if we moved. I tried to not have farm on Fridays. You have a whole extra day to like think about the stuff and study. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to do you a uh, service rather than trying to torture you with four hours on one day. Yes, ma'am. Um, so are there like all four on the test? Like we see it for room and ortho. Oh yeah. Okay. Hundred percent. We're gonna do it. The, you know, the the nice thing is there's a lot of overlap with these med uh, these meds, so we'll kind of kind of bust through this pretty quick. Um, Anyway, so we talked about uh, inflammatory bowel disease, now getting into our irritable bowel syndrome. Um, normally this can either be associated with like IBS with constipation, IBS with diarrhea, and so the treatment's gonna be a little different. Most of the meds we've already covered here, and we'll see that there's a few few new ones that are specific for the different subtypes, as we're gonna see here. Um, a lot of times you don't know why people get IBS, but certainly there could be some issues with, um, one thing I would do wanna note is this dysregulation with serotonin receptors, and that'll become important with a couple of the new meds we're gonna see here. In just a little bit. Um, certainly a lot of psychological factors can play a role here. A lot of this is can be stress induced and, and some patients are more prone to it. Um, as I mentioned, there's uh, certainly a mixed type, but you know, can usually classify patients as either having constipation predominant one, diarrhea predominant one, or uh, the mixed type. And actually I was talking to my wife uh, the other day and she's like, oh, would you guys cover in class? And I said, oh, we're going over like laxatives, all kinds of stuff. And she goes, have you ever read the reviews for mag citrate? <laughs> If you recall, I was telling you about Mag Citrate, I call it the, the green rocket because of how fast you have to go to the bathroom after you drink it. I encourage you there, uh, type in Mag Citrate Review Funny into Google and read that at your leisure, but it's pretty humorous and it will give you a, a pretty graphic picture of what that's like. <laughs> I'm not going to read it here for, uh, I don't want to offend anyone, but um, anyway, so obviously, you know, this can be pretty disruptive to a patient's quality of life, so we'd like to be able to help reduce their symptoms, improve overall quality of life with these patients as we will see with their medications. Um, a lot of this can be education, diet related, right? So if you can try to have them keep a diary of kind of what makes things worse, what makes things better, that way they can hopefully avoid some of those triggers there as you're gonna see. Obviously increasing fiber is always gonna be a good helpful thing for the, these patients here, whether it's more constipation related, diarrhea related, fiber is gonna be able to help out with that either way, which is kind of nice. And then certainly psychotherapy could help out in some cases, some CBT, you know, things like that can certainly um, be beneficial for some of these patients. So kind of breaking down into the different categories, the medications that are gonna be kind of most um, commonly used for, for each of these types here. Um, so for instance, you know, it's like bulk forming laxatives, which are what type of medications kind of fell into that? Yeah, like your psyllium husk, your, um, um, you know, your citrus cell, things like that, fall into that category. And again, you notice they can be good for both, right? Because not only do they, if you have diarrhea, it can kind of help solidify things a little bit and kind of bulk it up. That can be helpful if it's more um, constipation related. Again, it helps with sort of like lubrication, draws more water into the stool content, just makes that easier to pass. So it's good for either ones there, right? Um, certainly for constipation, we know things like our osmotic laxatives can be useful here. And so um, usually polyethylene glycol or Miralax is probably a good common one most patients are going to end up using. We'll talk about a couple of new things here as well. And then with the diarrhea aspect, we talk about loperamide. Why is loperamide handy? Why, why does that work for diarrhea? Because it's like an opioid. Mm -hmm. Right, it acts like an opioid, right? It acts on those mu receptors on the GI tract and helps to slow things down. Uh, from a peristalsis standpoint. And so again, we'll look at some other um, agents that might be useful here. Anyway, um, so again, looking at the bulk forming laxatives, what are some downsides to using a bulk forming laxative? Very good, yeah, so drug interactions can be a big one where you can have them bind up with one another, right? So you educate them to take their medications, you know, certain time periods apart. Um, palatability will be another big thing as well, right? Um, you know, a lot of these are very kind of gritty powders. Most patients don't really like the, the texture of, and so that can be a problem, you know, other than that, abdominal cramping, you know, things like that. 
Um, as I mentioned with the osmotic laxative, you know, I'd probably start off with something like a polyethylene glycol amirlax. You know, you're starting out with like one cap full, which is 17 grams a day, um, tends to be pretty effective for a lot of patients. But some people may have to be on things like mannic hydroxide um, daily, potentially, right? And sometimes it may even need sort of as needed um, things that kind of help move things along, like a, like a mag citrate, sodium phosphate, things like that. What was the risk with using too much sodium phosphate enemas? Hyperphosphatemia, very good. Yeah, I just remember in, in the extremes of age, this would be more probably an issue with like elderly patients you'd want to watch out for, especially that renal disease that could be definitely um, exacerbating that problem there. But um, a new drug here, we have one called Lubiprostone. This is actually going to be a derivative of PGE1, so it's kind of like a prostaglandin. And what it actually does is it helps to increase intestinal secretion of um, different fluids, and a lot of it has to do with this chloride channel activation, so it allows more, more fluid to come in, so it's going to be able to help out. Um, with those patients who are chronically constipated due to IBS. And so um, you do, the nice thing here is it works just right there in the GI tract. It doesn't really get absorbed at all. So um, very handy in, in terms of not causing a lot of systemic side effects. That could be one thing that you could use it as well. Typically for the osmotic laxatives, the bulk forming, are not effective, that's where you move to something like amateas at that point. Um, now we have the TCAs. Have we gotten those yet in behavioral? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk a lot more about it later on in this class, but um, this can be handy too because, again, what is a lot of the causes for these patients having symptoms related to their IBS? It could be stress, anxiety, depression can all exacerbate that. So if they have concomitant mental health issues, they may benefit from having something like a TCA on board because that can help basically pull double duty, work for their depression, anxiety, can also help out with that. So we have things like amitriptyline, amipramine. The benefits of these two as well as they're anticholinergic. So what does that do to GI effects? They're going to slow down peristalsis. So if they have constipation, may not be great because that can actually help exacerbate that potentially. But if they have more IBS with diarrhea, that may be beneficial, right? So they have to depend on on kind of how the patients are going to respond to it and see how it's going to be affecting their symptoms there. And hopefully they're taking diarrhea so they'd be able to keep track of that sort of thing. Okay. Um, keep in mind they do take a while to work, so three to four weeks or so before your antidepressants really start to kick in. Um, you know, it could be up to six weeks before you really see full effects in those cases there. Um, so this one's interesting. So we have a couple of serotonin modulators we'll, we'll see here. So for IBS with, with constipation, we have this 5-HD partial, uh, it's a 5-HD 4 receptor partial agonist called the Gasserod or Zelnorm. And this one's interesting because it's only uh, going to be effective for women. They actually did clinical studies and they found that for guys, they found no benefit over placebo, but for ladies, they did find some additional benefits there. So it's kind of interesting. You find certain medications that are just for one gender versus another here, but there's, here's one instance of it. Um, however, this is going to be like last line therapy for these patients here because there is some risk with things they've seen like ischemic colitis, um, really serious cases of diarrhea, men, um, causing electrolyte changes and dehydration, all kinds of things like that, uh, and some risk for cardiovascular events. And in fact, it's so hard to get a hold of, you have to undergo um, special um, you know, paperwork and everything, you have to get this IND process in order to even get um, access to it. So again, last line sort of therapy there for patients who really failed everything else. Um, in terms of antidiarrheals, we mentioned loperamide. Um, now, we mentioned it acts as an opioid. Is there any risk for things like, you know, say, uh, abuse or addiction? Why not? It doesn't cross the blood brain barrier very well. So you get the peripheral effects of an opioid, but you don't get the central effects. That's the benefit of using something like loperamide. Um, cholestyramine, we've talked about before. What kind of drug is that? Well, I'll ask this a question. So this is actually could be good for patients who have had cholecystectomies um, because if they're having sort of um, too, much, too many bile salts that are being sort of sent out and that's causing some of that diarrhea by binding up those bile acids, that can help that out uh, to some degree there. Um, so that could be a benefit. Again, if they have that history, this may be a decent option for those patients there. Um, again, normally things like cholestyramine come again as a powder and it can bind up with other medications, as you'll remember if you recall those drug interactions from last semester. Um, Again, palatability is not going to be great when they end up having to take that as well. On the opposite side, if we're treating IBS with diarrhea, we actually have a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist. This is a losatron, and this one actually is also just marketed for females as well, but only for IBS with, with diarrhea. And actually, this can cause ischemic colitis, severe constipation, and death in some cases. So again, this is another last line sort of therapy. If they fail everything else, this is what you could start for them, right? Um, if they develop any constipation related to this, if they have any abdominal pain, rectal bleeding, anything serious like that, they need to stop taking it right away because otherwise it could be at risk for some of these further kind of worsened um, sort of side effects. 
So last thing we'll talk about is some antispasmodic agents here briefly. So uh, basically these are mostly going to be anticholinergic medications, some of which I've mentioned already. Basically by decreasing the contraction of the GI smooth muscle, it's able to help deal with a lot of that cramping that's occurring there. Um, but be aware of the other anticholinergic side effects you're going to see with that. So your sedation, your dry mouth, your inner retention, all that's going to go right along with there. These are probably going to be more on an as-needed sort of basis because you will see tachyphylaxis that can develop. Tachyphylaxis just being what? Yeah, they lose efficacy over time. Even if you keep increasing the dose, you really don't see much benefit uh, additionally. Um, so we talked about a couple of these already. You have things like hyacinamine. We talked about glycopyrrolate as well being another big one. Uh, what did I say glycopyrrolate was also really good for? We use it for a lot of kids that have excessive drooling issues, so they can't control their secretions. Um, we can use that not only um, just for you know secretions from the mouth, but also if they're getting a lot of that backing up into the respiratory tract, they can also help um, kind of decrease some of that junkiness you might hear on, on your lung exam. Um, some other ones you actually have, this is kind of an old school med, we don't really have available too often anymore, but it's actually a mixture of a lot of different uh, anticholinergics like hyacinamines, scopolamine, and atropine, and then they actually have phenobarbital in there. So these are called your belladonna alkaloids. Ever heard that term belladonna before? First, the plant that it comes from. Anyone know what that means? A belladonna it means pretty lady. If anyone uh, uh, doesn't know, and so what they actually used to use is they'd use these. Um, plant extracts back in the day, I guess it might be like ancient Greece, I actually don't know what time frame it was, but it was a long time ago, uh, and they would actually put it in their eyes and it would cause what kind of effect? Cause dilation, cause mydriasis, and they thought that looked very attractive, right? So you'd have very wide open pupils. I imagine if I ever went on a date with a lady and she showed up with very wide pupils like that, I think she's on methamphetamines right now. Um, let's see how it goes. No. Um, <laughs> And that's how I got married. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> anyway, so um, so that one's not too too available anymore because it's got phenobarb in it, and we mentioned that phenobarb before. We talked about that as what type of medication? It was an anti-seizure medication, if you recall, and uh, we would actually know that to be a controlled substance. So that one's a little bit tougher to get a hold of. It's kind of gone by the wayside a little bit. But here's some other agents you have uh, certainly available to you. The most common ones I run into are probably hyacinamine, bicyclamine, and the glycopyrrolate for the most part. Okay, and um, in some cases you may find there can be some issues with bacterial overgrowth, and so here's a drug called rifaximin. It's actually kind of similar a little bit to um, drugs like rifampin, but this one doesn't actually get absorbed at all systemically, so it kind of works just there in the GI tract. And so if they have like a small intestinal bowel overgrowth, the SIBO, this can be useful from, from that standpoint. Um, however, they have started to see some resistance with it, so, um, you know, again, maybe beneficial, depends on what, kind of what, they're, what they're growing there in the GI tract. Okay, so anyway, so um, you know, kind of a nice flow chart kind of showing you how we would manage these patients here. Again, doesn't really matter which way you go. You need to work on the non-pharmacologic uh, therapies first. And then obviously either way, you know, increasing fiber in their diet is going to be beneficial for most of those patients there. If they have more like diarrhea predominant things, think about things that may affect their diet. Things like lactose can maybe be a big problem if they're lactose intolerant. Um, I have one cousin who is extremely lactose intolerant. He actually uses that as a, a weapon against us when we hang out sometimes. It's, so yes, I will go for that ice cream, and we're like, please no, and it does it anyway, right? Um, but again, think about kind of what your first line agents are going to be, right? So again, if it's more constipation predominant, you can think about adding those bulk forming laxatives, those osmotic laxatives on there. Um, if it's more diarrhea related, loperamide, cholestyramine, maybe if they have that history of a cholecystectomy, those kind of things might be good options. And then we mentioned those kind of last line agents there, whether you're using a losatron, or if it would be something like tegasterol. Remember, those are really only going to be limited to females, and again, a lot of side effects, really serious side effects associated with them, so not used too, too frequently. Okay, so any questions on that part? If not, let's move on. Get into our room section. It's only a scant hundred slides. I don't know why you guys are worried about us running out of time. I got this. I've been doing this for a long time. Time management is my middle name. My parents are very strange. But, um, anyway, so we've covered a lot of these drugs already, which is beneficial. We'll kind of talk about them in terms of looking at rheumatoid arthritis predominantly. Um, 
We will also kind of look at osteoarthritis as well, sort of at the same time, to kind of compare and contrast the two together, kind of look at how we're going to be managing. And that's actually going to fall really well, or flow really well into the ortho section, the last one, because that's mainly going to be pain management stuff we're talking about there. So it's going to be a nice kind of flow into that. Not that I planned it that way, but it just happened to be that, that's how CMS was scheduled, right? Um, so anyway, so the immune response, we've talked about this extensively before. We know that when you have an autoimmune condition, the body's attacking itself. It sees something as a foreign material. It's activating the inflammatory cascade and so you're finding T cells getting activated, B cells activated, complement system and everything and eventually leads to tissue destruction, right? So in some cases maybe causing you to have diabetes, in some cases it's causing you to have ulcerative colitis. Here we're mainly going to be talking about the joints in terms of rheumatoid arthritis but certainly you'll find uh, some other things we'll talk about here, including like, you know, gout, how that can be uh, uh, playing a role here, how some medications can also kind of work out for that. Um, but basically this is what we're going to be referring to. And so we talked about a lot of medications here that are going to be beneficial. So like already knowing that we're dealing with an autoimmune condition, what kind of drugs would you think about using? So I heard like some uh, immunosuppressants such as methotrexate. Okay, that could be a good one. Like what else? Steroids. Steroids, absolutely. Like steroids are always going to be the cornerstone. If they're having an acute exacerbation of any of these, steroids are always going to be the way to go, right? Uh, what else could we use? NSAIDs are going to be another big uh, big set of drugs we're going to be using here to treat rheumatoid arthritis, right? So again, you already have a feel for, okay, well, I'm dealing with an inflammatory process. How am I going to deal with that? I've already seen some of the medications that can do that. And remember, this is sort of a perpetuating sort of cycle. As it does more damage, you're getting more inflammation there, and it just kind of goes further and further, right? Um, and again, we can know that there's several places where our drugs can kind of fit in to do, interrupt the system here, right? So obviously, we know that kind of from the top down, the most important thing we can do is always introduce steroids, because where do the steroids work at? The very beginning of the chain, in the nucleus itself, right? So they're actually changing gene transcription, right? So they're very powerful from that standpoint, because then you're not even liberating a lot of those phospholipids from the cell membranes, right? It doesn't even get to the point where it's arachidonic acid to go through either the lipoxygenase pathway or the cyclooxygenase pathway. But certainly once it gets to that point, this is where you know our NZs are going to be fitting into playing a role here, right? So we've kind of gone through this, and we'll see how our medication will be playing a role here. We can also see where um, newer types of anti um, immunosuppressants are also going to be fitting into this uh, pathway. So anyway, so again, we're talking about RA. Why do, why do we care about RA sort of like in the long term? What's sort of the, the negative things that can develop from it? Joint deformities can be a big thing, right? So, um, you know, you can have uh, loss of dexterity, so they're not able to do a lot of their activity of daily living in a lot of cases. This will be important for some of the meds we're going to talk about. Some of them are actually, they come in a pin formulation where it's actually an injectable product that comes as a pin. They'll basically hit the top while their joints are deformed to where they can't even use it. That may not be a really good drug option for them, right? Um, they can't get the pill bottles open themselves, right, because they have the child-resistant containers on there. Um, do you know how resistant child-resistant containers are? Not very to children, to adults though, they can be quite quite resistant, right? So um, little things like that you have to consider there. Do you know how they actually test those child resistant containers? They'll give it to groups of kids to see how long it takes them to break into it, and they'll give it to adults to make sure that they can still get into it, and they have to make sure they meet certain time frames, and then once they meet that. So uh, note here, it's not child proof, right? Nothing is child proof, I will definitely tell you that. Um, like the other day, my kid was like walking around with like a bottle of like Guafenis and she's just like shaking it around. I'm like, where'd you even get that from? Like, I didn't even know we had this in the house. She found it somehow and that was it, right? Um, but anyway, so you're going to find that this is a progressive disease and so we want to start early, right? We want to try to get in early because we can save the joints as best we can using some of our disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs we're going to see there, right? So I'm sure you talked about DMARDs with Professor O, correct? Yes. Um, so the big thing here is to start early. We'll look at there's medications that are better for more sort of acute management of symptoms and some that are going to be better for sort of delaying progression of disease, kind of similar to some other disease states we've talked about before. Um, but again, you're getting this kind of progressive inflammation right there in the joint itself. And the body just can't tell the difference between self versus foreign uh, sort of products there. Um, in terms of different components are going to be playing a role here. So for instance, things like B lymphocytes play a big role. We're going to see there's certain medications that can affect them specifically. Have you talked about any of those? Don't worry, we'll talk about them later. Um, but we're going to see it by interrupting different systems here, either by interrupting the actual cells themselves from working or potentially um, interacting with like certain cell surface receptors or by certain mediators, things like tumor necrosis factor, that we can interrupt this whole pathway here and really help to decrease that inflammation. So, um, and again, 
less of these neutrophils are going to be getting activated here means we're getting less of those free radicals being formed, less of that denaturation of uh, tissues and uh, proteins and the cells are not going to commit apoptosis, less damage overall. So again, this is why we're talking about them as being modifying drugs because they're slowing down the progress here. So um, again, in terms of like T-cells activation, certainly we're worried about things like tumor necrosis factor. Also interleukins will be playing a big role here. So we'll have certain monoclonal antibodies that we can have to target these directly. Have we talked about any TNF-alpha uh, monoclonal antibodies recently? Mm -hmm. Like Humira or Adalimumab or... Yeah, Remicator and Fliximab, right? Um, and so, you know, these are different medications we're going to have to actually interrupt this process initially. That way they keep the T-cell from even being activated in the first place, right? Um, also see a lot of prostaglandins and bradykinins and things like that being formed here. We're going to see this is where NSAIDs can come and play a role by working as an anti-inflammatory agent, right? Could I use Tylenol for this purpose? No, right? Tylenol is not anti-inflammatory, right? So we're going to basically see the RA. Tylenol has no role to play at all because it doesn't deal with the inflammation that's ultimate cause for the disease in the first place, right? And again, you can kind of see how this process goes down. I can see eventual degradation of the joint. You see this pan is starting to form here is what causes a lot of that deformation. And again, it's kind of this very cyclic sort of process here. And you can see the inflammatory mediators as they kind of go between different cell types activating one another. This is where we can interrupt this process and prevent those from being activated. Now, it'd be nice if we could just target the joint itself, but you're going to see that a lot of our meds are going to be working more systemically. So what kind of risk do you think are going to be associated with that? If I'm suppressing the immune system, infection. infection, right? It's going to be a big risk with any of these medications here, right? So you got to be really careful from that standpoint. Just like if we're giving them chemotherapy, it's maybe a less harsh form of uh, immunosuppression than that, but it's certainly still going to be a big risk, right? Um, now, to compare with OA, what is kind of the pathophys for osteoarthritis? wear and tear, right? So again, this is why I see patients who are giving um, their joints extra wear and tear over time. They develop that sooner. So, you know, if they're overweight or if they're overusing the joints, things like that, um, most people are going to develop at least to some degree at some point. And it's huge because it causes, um, you know, a big need for like knee replacements and hip replacements, um, you know, cost a lot of money, especially this is where a lot of patients start out with sort of acute pain due to osteoarthritis that turns into chronic pain and a lot of patients get started on opioids and then sometimes never get off, right? So that's uh, kind of a, a gradual slide you'll see there with some of those patients. And of course, look, kind of looking at the, the comparison between the two rheumatoid arthritis versus osteo, see here the osteoarthritis, that pain is just coming from the bone just kind of grinding on itself, right? Those little nociceptive fibers that are there just getting activated um, due to that kind of that physical grinding versus here is much more of an inflammatory process here. So you'll see there's a little bit of overlap between how we're going to be treating this, but there will be some key differences as well. So um, again, we're seeing that we're having a breakdown of that cartilage that's there. You're going to be seeing, you know, is there any way to get that cartilage back? Maybe. We'll look at some uh, means to try to help that out, but for the most part, you know, the best thing you can do in a lot of cases, especially more progressive disease, is just to get a new joint altogether, but which may not be possible if they have like, you know, things like joint, arth uh, you know, hand arthritis and things like that. But um, we'll look at some different ways we can try to manage that. And again, just kind of looking and compare, con uh, contrasting sort of a normal joint versus one that's more osteoarthritic. Um, you'll see sort of the, the changes that happen here. Um, again, you get this sort of, um, uh, you know, deformation over time, not the same as you would see with RA, but certainly you're going to see that loss of cartilage and it's causing that physical grinding of bone on bone. Okay, so our goals for both of these, obviously um, dealing with the acute symptoms, so things like relieving pain and stiffness, um, you know, if you can reduce inflammation, if it is present in a way, some of those patients may have more or less uh, present at the time there, and then obviously improve quality of life for those patients. Um, are there really any like good disease modifying therapies you think for like osteoarthritis? Not really, right? So again, the best thing to do to try to decrease the wear and tear on the joint is to do what? Lose weight, use it less. You know, if you're doing strenuous activities that tend to stress out the joints, you know, that can certainly, uh, you know, uh, hasten that process there. Um, but yeah, there were, so we're not going to see the same sort of sort of uh, controller sort of therapy as we'll see for uh, osteoarthritis as we would for rheumatoid arthritis. So there'll be some key differences from, from that standpoint there. Because again, for Ari, one of the big things is slowing down that disease progression. So non-pharmacologic therapy, obviously, you know, things like physical therapy is going to be a big cornerstone of this. It's really, really important that you're kind of coordinating between, you know, not just the pharmacologic therapy, but also the physical therapy aspect of it. But why do a lot of people not like to do their physical therapy? 
it hurts, right? So why would they want to do something that hurts, right? We're physiologically designed not to do things that hurt. Um, it's a lot of work. Or maybe they're not being compensated well from an insurance standpoint. It's costing them out-of-pocket money, right? So there's a lot of reasons why they may not want to do this, but it is absolutely integral that you incorporate that, right? But certainly weight loss can help. Assisted devices, heat, cold, all that can be very beneficial here. Obviously, surgery is kind of the end point there. Uh, we'll talk about some of that pain management we'll be dealing with, say, for instance, after something like joint replacement in the next section. So comparing the pharmacologic therapy between the two here, we see with RA that chronic treatment, we're going to be typically seeing NSAIDs are going to be playing a very big role here. We also see low-dose corticosteroids. Now, what do we mention with using chronic corticosteroids in something like ulcerative colitis? Generally, you don't want to do it, right? So if you can get them off the corticosteroids, it's always beneficial because we know the chronic long-term complications of using those steroids, right? So you know, see thin skinning and osteoporosis and um, immunosuppression and diabetes and glaucoma and all these other things that pop up because of that. Here, you may need it because the inflammation can be pretty severe for a lot of those patients, right? Versus with chronic treatment, we're going to be seeing a bigger focus on things like acetaminophen, for osteoarthritis, because again, there may not be a big inflammatory component at the joint itself. We'll be seeing NSAIDs are going to be playing a role as well. And then we'll actually see some topical analgesics, because in some cases, it may just be one joint that's affected, one or two joints, in which case topical therapy may be appropriate for that patient there versus something that's more kind of widespread over, you know, over the whole body. Topical treatment may not be great. So you're saying that the low dose corticosteroids for rheumatoid, it's, it's good because it, the benefits outweigh the risks? In some cases, yeah, you may find that the benefits are outweighed by those risks associated with the corticosteroids. It's not ideal, but sometimes you got to do it, right? So I'll see like a lot, as so we have, we deal, at least what I see most commonly are kids that have juvenile idiopathic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, um, and a lot of times they try to move them off of the corticosteroids by implementing other things like the disease modifying meds like methotrexate or, um, you know, infliximab or things like that. So they, they try at all costs to get them off that just because we know the, the complications. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you got to do what you got to do, right? Um, for acute exacerbations for RA, certainly corticosteroids are going to be the big thing. So if they're coming in with an acute exacerbation, corticosteroids are going to be the mainstay there. Make it a big, say, IV dose of methylprednisolone. I see sometimes patients come in and just get a big one gram dose. You know, you think about a typical dose of methylpred is like 125 milligrams, maybe for like anaphylaxis, you know, uh, maybe 60 milligrams for asthma. We're getting like a gram, right? How many milligrams is that? A thousands. It's a really big dose because they have just such bad inflammation. You want to get that under control immediately, right? Um, for acute exacerbations for osteoarthritis, corticosteroids may, are not really going to do a whole lot of good for us because, again, the pathophys is just different. So this is where opioid analgesics will come into play. Um, obviously, with RA, the DMARDs are going to be key to slowing down the progression of the disease. We'll look at that. And in some cases, though, you can still do things like aspirations of the joint, so that can be effective for either one of these. And then we'll talk about intraarticular corticosteroid injection. What do you think of the benefit of using it just in the joint? Limited systemic actions, right? So if you can do something like a cortisone shot or a triamcinolone or something like that directly into the joint, you're not going to get as much systemic effects. So the joints themselves are pretty well walled off. They're not going to have as much uh, bioavailability as you would see if it was like an IM dose or something, right? Anyway, so getting into the, the DMARDs, these are disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. We'll talk about them as either being biologic in age or non-biologic. I'm going to say biologic because that means what? They're protein-based typically, right? So most often the monoclonal antibodies we'll mention there. Um, again, these need to be initiated as early as possible, but you know sometimes you may not catch it early depending on especially with really mild disease. They just don't know until later on. Um, we certainly see more favorable outcomes with that. And then NSAIDs and corticosteroids, these are going to be good for immediate sort of symptomatic relief. Most of these patients are probably going to at least be on a, cortico on a uh, NSAID chronically, if not plus or minus a, a corticosteroid. So the traditional DMARs we're going to mention here, now a lot of these we've already talked about, which is kind of beneficial. So for instance, we know about methotrexate, right? What are some risks with methotrexate? LFTs, it's triadogenic, you can find hepatotoxicity. I'll never forget one of my aunts was diagnosed with breast cancer. She got put on uh, methotrexate uh, for a while and she was just like, great, now I can't go drink it anymore. And she couldn't because her LFTs would be even worse after that because you don't want to combine the two together. Very bummed about that. But um, hydroxychloroquine, have we, did we mention that with UC? I don't think we did. This will be a new one we'll talk about here. Um, Sulfasalazine, I know we definitely mentioned, right? We talked about that in terms of being used for uh, Crohn's disease and whatnot, and then leflunamide as well. So we'll talk about some of these, how they can be used. I think even some of these we saw back with MS treatment, 
if you recall, I mean, like lithalunamide we mentioned uh, being mentioned uh, as used for, for MS. And again, completely different disease states, but the pathophys is similar enough that these drugs are working as immunosuppressants to help decrease that inflammation against our cells, essentially. In terms of the biologic DMARs, again, this is another like blockbuster set of meds. So you're seeing new ones of these come out all the time. Every time I go to my parents' house, um, they always have like, you know, normal TV on, which I don't have anymore. And um, the commercials that are on constantly, they're always like for a different monoclonal antibody. Like, I've never heard of that one. Didn't hear about that one. Didn't hear about that one. It's really hard to keep up with. But if you know something about one of them, you kind of know something about a lot of them, right? As you'll find. And as you get into your specialties, you'll be very honed in on that field and you'll, you'll know those new meds as they come out. Um, but things like infliximab we've mentioned before, things like adalimumab, um, but we'll mention a couple other ones here as well. These are all the anti-TNF alpha ones, right? So these are specifically working against tumor necrosis factor. Um, but there's some other ways we can modify the system as well. So we look at uh, Batacept, which is going to be co-stimulation modulator. We'll look at that in just a few moments. Um, we can target interleukin-6. This is where we have something like tocilizumab or rituximab. Uh, and then here's actually a new class of drugs here. It's called a JAK inhibitor. This one's actually going to be pretty novel as compared to some of the other ones. Uh, it's called tofacitinib or Zeljans. So we actually have some other older older school agents we used to use a long time ago. Um, some of these may be used for more sort of, um, you know, maybe more resistant disease that kind of failed other therapies. Some of these are just kind of gone by the wayside entirely. Um, so for instance, like, you know, patients, um, some cases they have really good insurance. We give them like gold-based products. We don't do that. Um, but gold itself is pretty toxic to the cells, right? So has anyone ever heard the term born with a silver spoon in their mouth? What does that mean? Nowadays, it means like you're, they, they assume you were born rich, right? The actual uh, sort of, uh, I guess, etymology of that, I think it's the term, um, comes from back in the day, silver used to be used as an anti-infective because silver itself is a toxic kind of molecule. So they say if you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth, you're actually healthy, you didn't get sick very much. So things like silver, things like um, gold can be cytotoxic, right? Not just to bacteria, but also to our own cells. So we used to use gold-based products actually to attack the immune system there, but it had a lot of toxicity associated with it, so you don't really use that much anymore. Um, but other things like anakinra, cyclosporin, um, some really severe cases for inflammation, we use things like cyclophosphamide. Where did we talk about that before? Remember for cancer, right, it was one of those alkylating agents, right? So you may even see that being used as a really severe, let's say, we got to get this inflammation under control. Steroids aren't working, like cyclophosphamide might be just the one to go with. But again, a lot of toxicities associated with these agents, mainly why they've gone, kind of gone by the wayside. Um, do you know how you like call out for somebody who's wearing like a lot of gold chains and stuff? Go, hey, you. <laughs> um, so in terms of the DMARDs, so again, we mentioned the biologic versus non-biologic ones here. Um, we don't know the full mechanism for some of these, especially the non-biologic agents here. Overall, though, we will find uh, the methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine tend to be the best in terms of efficacy to toxicity ratios, right? Um, hydroxychloroquine is probably the wimpiest out of the bunch, but also the safest. Uh, methotrexate, probably a little bit more toxic than that, but it's also a little bit more effective. But they tend to be sort of your first stop for a lot of those patients there. Um, for instance, a lot of patients with methotrexate and corticosteroids, it may be pretty good for holding off symptoms for, you know, say more than five years in some cases. So that can be a very effective combination. In some cases, you may need to combine different DMARDs together, and this I'll show you some kind of logic to how we combine those together. Um, in general, what I'll mention is you can use two non-biologics together pretty easily. You can use a non-biologic plus a biologic together pretty easily. You typically don't want to ever com uh, combine two biologics together. The immunosuppression tends to be too much, too big a risk for infection. We just don't do it for the most part. Okay. A lot of patients, though, tend to be started off with methotrexate as kind of first line for most of those patients, mainly because they can tolerate it long term and it can serve as a good backbone to adding on other drugs to it, right? So again, if they find methotrexate, it's not really, maybe the effectiveness is starting to wear off. You can add on other things to it and kind of increase that effect efficacy. So um, you tend to find that the traditional non-biologic DMARDs have a pretty slow onset of action, maybe three to six months or so, whereas some of these will have a little bit faster onset, like methotrexate, sulfasalazine, and leflunamide are going to be a little bit faster from that standpoint. Uh, biologic DMARDs, on the other hand, they work pretty much immediately, right? And that kind of makes sense if you're comparing the mechanisms to one another. So for instance, with methotrexate, that's working by doing what? blocking utilization of folic acid so I can't produce new DNA in those white cells that are rapidly dividing so I'm inhibiting their ability to replicate. Does that sound like a very fast process? 
pretty slow, right? Because again, you don't immediately kill off the white cells. You're giving them time before they need to replicate. They realize they can't, and then that triggers off that apoptosis process, right? Uh, on the other hand, though, if you have a biologic DMARD, something that's going to be attacking TNF alpha immediately because it's an antibody, antibodies work fast, then you can see why it would have a much quicker onset of action than, than the traditional ones. So that's one thing to consider. Um, in terms of the immunosuppression you're going to see there, again, TB testing is going to be pretty much mandatory before start, uh, starting any of the biologic DMARDs. It's not a bad idea to do with any of the other ones as well because um, obviously the risk is if they have a latent TB infection and you suppress the immune system, you can then activate it, right? And you typically want to get your vaccinations done beforehand, and that's because why? So it depends on the type of vaccine that we're giving, right? So for one, overall, if they're on immunosuppressant, the vaccines are going to be more or less efficacious. Overall, less efficacious because you don't have an immune system to actually attack it to form that sort of immunity, that, that uh, immune memory, right? So you can give a inactivated dead vaccine to the patient while they're on one of these immunosuppressants, but you may find they don't really get a good response to it. They don't really have good full immunity to it, right? If I give something like a live attenuator where it's just a weakened form of a virus or a bacteria, what could happen? They may get the disease itself, right? So for instance, if we're looking at like say the flu vaccine, right? So there's a couple of different varieties and we have a whole immunization section, we'll talk about this later, but just as a preview for that, because I know a lot of you are very interested in talking about immunizations, right? We'll memorize the entire schedule, right? I'm just kidding, I don't, I don't make you guys do that. But um, not to say that your CMS class you may not have to do that, word to the wise. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> Point being is we have a live attenuated form of the flu vaccine, which most people get, and then we have the inactivated form. And so, for instance, if I had one of these patients on a DMARD, I would definitely not want to give them the live attenuated form because they could actually get the flu at that point, right? Because their body would be able to fight off even that weakened variety of it. However, I could still give them the inactivated form. They just may not get as good of a response to it, okay? So it's kind of the trade-offs you're going to see between those. We'll talk about that as well as we come up in the specifics here. Um, now, that means if you had a patient who, say, for instance, so with something like the flu that comes out every single year, if you had a patient who was on one of these DMARDs, um, would you just not give them the flu vaccine altogether, the inactivated form? Again, look at the risk versus benefits, right? So, again, I'm giving them the inactivated form, so I'm not worried about them actually getting the flu because of that. But it may not be as effective. That's probably okay, right? I'm kind of willing to hedge my bets because, again, if these patients get the flu, is it going to be worse or better than if someone within a competent immune, with a competent immune system gets it? It's going to be a lot worse, right? So this is why we go ahead and give it to them a lot of times anyway. So only give them the inactivated form just so it may not be as effective. And even in some cases, we'll give certain vaccines earlier if we know they're going to be on these immunosuppressants, things like, you know, the herpes zoster given at 50 instead of 60, right? It's American College of Rheumatology is ACR recommendation. <clears throat> So getting into it, you know, methotrexate is going to be inhibiting a lot of cytokine formation. It's going to be inhibiting DNA synthesis, et cetera, within these cells there by interrupting um, that folic acid cycle there, right? So you can't produce those, those uh, nucleotides um, that are necessary to produce new DNA, new RNA, et cetera. Um, again, we've seen this picture before, how it kind of will sub in for uh, tetrahydrofolate and prevent that recycling process from happening there, basically interrupting it completely, right? Um, if I had someone who had too much methotrexate on board, how would I fix that problem? Yeah, what's the activated form of folic acid? <coughs> Folinic acid, what's the other name for it? You know, leucovorin, we talked about that. Leucovorin is the another name for the folinic acid, right? Because you can get that because it's just, it's already the activated form. Basically, methotrexate preventing the activation step from occurring there, right? Obviously, we know side effects are going to be those rapidly dividing cells are going to be the first things that get hit. So that's where you can see the GI effects. That's where you can see the nausea vomiting, the bone marrow suppression, et cetera, that can come about from that. Um, keep in mind, you got to watch the renal function as well. It's not just the liver you have to worry about this causing a problem for, but you also have to worry about the renal function. What was the risk, especially with like higher dose methotrexate in the, in the kidneys? Remember, it can precipitate out and cause interstitial damage, right? So you need them to have good renal function to actually clear the drug itself. So that's another big consideration there. Um, so for instance, if they have like a creatinine clearance less than 40, this might not be a good drug for them, or you may have to monitor for serial levels. Um, and again, if you're looking at the dosing between like methotrexate for RA versus say for cancer, how would you compare the doses? Which one would be lower? Probably for RA, right? And sometimes patients will be giving this themselves, not just orally, but sometimes subcutaneous injections. Uh, they may just be doing it once a weekly. It depends on the dosing schedule they're with. I had one lady who called into the poison center because she was dosing herself at home. She had actually given herself an entire week's worth of methotrexate, like on a Saturday, and then she forgot 
and then gave herself another dose on Sunday, right? So then all of a sudden she had way too high methotrexate levels. We had to send her in. Anyone remember what we gave to help clear it from the kidneys? To prevent that precipitation from occurring? So remember it has to do with the pH of the urine, right? Normally pH of the urine is what? Yeah, so it normally goes a little bit more acidic. The more acidic it is, the less um, soluble the methotrexate is. We give bicarb to increase that pH back up, and that will help to keep it more soluble. So we actually end up putting on a bicarb drip until our levels kind of got down to, to normal. But just be aware of that, right? And obviously, why is it bad in pregnancy? It's rhodogenic. What's the other name for it that can induce? It's an abortifacient, right? It can actually induce abortion. So uh, that's another thing to, to be watchful for. But this is probably the most commonly used DMARD you're going to see out there for RA. Um, pretty effective, again, a little bit faster than some of the other ones, usually within one to two months or so, and fairly acceptable in terms of toxicity, but we obviously know what to monitor for, right? So you're looking at CBCs, you're looking at LFTs, renal function, et cetera, right? Um, certainly doing it baseline, and then you're going to be following up with them pretty consistently to make sure those levels are staying right within uh, the normal ranges there. Sometimes we'll get folic acid. It helps to alleviate some of these side effects, but again, that's just to help out some of the other healthy cells, maybe the ones that are not rapidly dividing as much. Um, again, how much efficacy we're going to get from this, questionable, but um, yeah, who couldn't use a little bit more folic acid in their diet, right? Like, they're probably going to get anyway from a lot of the enriched foods and things they're going to eat. Anyway, moving on to leflunamide. This one is also going to be another drug, kind of similar in process. We're going to be inhibiting pyrimidine synthesis there, so we're going to find that it will help to um, prevent replication of those white cells, decrease, you know, um, transcription, all of those inflammatory genes, things like that. Um, remember, this is a prodrug that gets broken down into the active formulation there. Remember, we talked about teriflunamide. Um, for that was sort of the, the activated form of leflunamide here. Um, remember, this is a problem for patients who want to get pregnant. Anyone remember why that was? Why does it stay in your system for so long? Yeah, enterohepatic recirculation, right? We mentioned this with MS before. Um, again, this is something where, and again, if your patients are old enough to the point of they're postmenopausal and not worried about them getting pregnant, it may not be an issue, right? Um, but if they're younger, you may find, again, we have kids who are like children who have uh, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, um, and so you'd have to do that washout with cholestyramine, right? Because that undergoes that enterohepatic recirculation, give them cholestyramine, and it'll bind it up and get rid of it. Because you can find the stuff in the, in the system years after you even stop taking it because of that recycling that goes on there. Um, this one has pretty fast onset of action as well, pretty equal uh, efficacy compared to methotrexate. Um, but again, you have to kind of know who your audience is in terms of, you know, are they looking to get pregnant at some point? That may, this may be a really bad drug for them uh, in that setting there. Obviously, in terms of monitoring, again, you want to watch for LTs, CBCs, pregnancy status. would be another big thing to watch out for. Because again, patients, do they always know when they get pregnant? They have like that big light that shines over their head, the big banner held up by the little cherubs and say, you're pregnant. No. Oftentimes they don't know, and so that organogenesis phase in that first trimester is where this is most likely to cause problems. Um, hydroxychloroquine, this is something you may see used occasionally with your patients with sickle cell disease. I'm not going to talk about that too much here in this class. Um, but as I mentioned, this one's the least toxic, but it's also probably the safest DMARD out of the bunch, um, or at least efficacious, I should say, out of the bunch. More for mild disease, or you may see this added on to something else. So maybe on methotrexate, had good control, starting to wane a little bit adding on hydroxychloroquine can be a good um, uh, help there, right? Um, this one, you can see why it's not as toxic because it's not really inhibiting things like DNA production. It's like doing things like inhibiting neutrophil locomotion, right? So they can't really get to the site of inflammation quite so well. Um, you know, impairing things like complement dependent uh, antigen antibody reactions, right? So that way those immune cells are not getting activated as much. A um, little bit longer in terms of onset, you know, two to four months or so, and very mild in terms of its toxicity. You don't have to worry about renal function, hepatic function necessarily, myosuppression. None of that's going to be seen with this one. Uh, some things you do want to be cautious of, you can see, um, you do want to check visual acuity while they're on this medication because you can see some change like um, accommodation effects or blurred vision because of this drug. And you may see things like increased skin pigmentation. Um, again, maybe more distressing for some patients but more than others, just depends on, you know, kind of what they're, um, how they're experiencing it. Um, slowly reversible in some cases may not be if they're on really chronic therapy for, for a long time. Sulfazalazine, we mentioned briefly here. Remember, this one gets broken down into two products, the so sulfapyridine and 5 amino salicylic acid. Um, again, just like it works for ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, it works the same way here as we're going to see. Um, again, nice things it does as well is it helps in kind of inhibit TNF alpha to some degree. It doesn't bind it up like a 
you know, an infliximab might, but it does help to inhibit its function a little bit there. And can actually scavenge free radicals, right? So it helps to decrease some of the oxidative stress caused by those reactive oxygen species there. Um, again, one to four months or so, so fairly quick in terms of its onset of action. Um, who might not be a good candidate for this drug? So if they have an aspirin allergy, absolutely. What else? What other allergy? Yeah, so for allergy, if they just have the chicken pox, may not be a good option for them, right? Because you worry about Ray syndrome because of the 5 amino salicylic acid, right? So that 5 ASA still counts as a salicylate, right? Um, here you're going to find that uh, sulfasalazine itself, the sulfapyridine that gets formed there, remember we talked about that causing a lot of side effects in terms of patients with like Crohn's disease, which is why we switched over using things like mesalamine, which is just the 5-ASA product there. But for this, because inflammation is typically more severe, this is why we want both of them being in there. Um, again, watch out for things like, you know, it's going to turn the stools kind of orangish in coloration, so we've got to warn them about that. Um, watch out for binding of things like, you know, antibiotics, iron supplements can affect that. Remember how this gets broken down into the active components? colonic bacteria, right? So if I'm giving me antibiotics and I'm disrupting that, may actually decrease the efficacy of the drug itself, right? So things to watch out for. Um, the biggest thing to watch out for is going to be the LFTs with this one. Um, less, less severe myelosuppression as you would see with something like a methotrexate, but certainly LFTs I would definitely watch out for. Okay, so this is kind of like an in-between between the, the biologics and non-biologics. Um, I'll mention it here, but in terms of efficacy, it's nearly as good as a biologic agent like a Humira, like a Remicade. Um, although the nice benefit with this one, actually gonna see it's an orally available agent, right? All the ones we've talked about so far can be used orally. This is another one that can be used. And obviously oral products are good from a compliance standpoint, right? Um, so this one's a novel mechanism. It's kind of the newest class of drugs in this category here. It's called a JAK inhibitor. So if you recall, we talked about tyrosine kinase receptors. Anyone remember that term? Remember that it is an important cell signaling Molecules. So, for instance, like your insulin receptors are tyrosine phosphate or tyrosine kinase um, receptors, right? So, anyway, so you find that when you have things like interleukin here come and activate this tyrosine kinase receptor here, these jack proteins get activated. They go down and eventually produce a lot of the inflammation that happens there. Well, if I inhibit those proteins, and this uh, jack just stands for Janus kinase. Um, basically you're going to find that you'll decrease activation of a lot of those proteins that regulate that transcription of those inflammatory genes. So basically you just inhibit this whole process here. And so you can kind of think about in terms of like efficacy, like it's kind of doing a lot of what the corticosteroids would do by decreasing transcription of a lot of those inflammatory genes, right? So it actually is very effective in a lot of cases by inhibiting those JAK proteins. So as I mentioned, the other benefit, it's available orally. And you can use them in combination with other DMARDs, right? So I could use methotrexate plus Zeljans. You typically don't want to recommend it in combination with the biologics. The immune suppression is going to be too severe in those cases there, right? So this is one exception to that rule I mentioned before. Don't put Zeljans plus a biologic agent, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, do you want to be watchful? You definitely have to check for TB beforehand. Right, so because again, it is pretty potent as an immunosuppressant, you want to check for TB beforehand. And there are some risks for things like secondary malignancies. Again, it's fairly new, so we don't have as much evidence for use in some of the more long term complications that we do with something like methotrexate, it's been around for forever, right? Okay, uh, let's see. Any questions before we get started? Back, yes. No, it is not, right? Because it couldn't use an oral yeah. protein, right? So it's kind of like, um, you can think about it some of the cancer drugs that were similar to it. So like um, Jafitinib and um, I'm trying to think of any other ones off the top of my head. There's a couple. Imatinib was another one. Yeah. So those are all kind of that. Some, that nib really just means that it's a tyrosine kinase receptor inhibitor is essentially what that's referring to, right? And remember, it was nice because it was so specific, like with cancer, because you could shoot for like certain mutations of certain. Remember, it's like CML with this like one very specific mutation it would affect. This one's a little bit more broadly acting, right? Because it will be affecting immune the immune system system wide, right? It's not just looking for a, one specific target there. Um, but anyway, and so let's see. Um, getting back into our biologics. So remember we talked about that there's a lot of different like uh, parts of the name there. Remember that you can make monoclonal bodies differently depending on the protein makeup, right? So uh, again, which one do you think would have the most risk for anaphylaxis? The ones that are like humans? Hmm? The ones that are like humans? The ones that are not like humans, yes. Yeah, so the less human protein that it has, 
uh, and typically it's murine protein, which we mentioned is what? Is mouse protein. The more it has of that, the more foreign it looks, the more likely you are to have a, um, a reaction risk, right? An actual anaphylactoid, anaphylactic reaction to it. Um, so as an example, we'll talk about a couple of these. Um, so we'll talk about infliximab or Remicade. That one is going to be one of these chimeric ones where you see that there's both murine and human protein to it. Um, and that one does carry more anaphylaxis risk with it, right? That's an IV only infusion that will have patients come in usually like every four weeks, six, eight weeks, whatever the, the dosing schedule is, and actually get that there. And a lot of times they get pre medications to make sure they don't have any infusion reactions, right? Because it's not full blown anaphylaxis we're just looking for. It's all sort of the, um, the gray areas in between, the sort of anaphylactoid reactions, right? So, for instance, if they start to have a mild reaction to it. They got fever. Like, how would I treat that fever? I treat fever. Tylenol, right? They got fever. Easy. Tylenol. Um, so a lot of times these patients will get a dose of Tylenol before they receive infliximab, right? Um, if they get, say, itchy when they receive the drug, they give them. Give them an antihistamine, give them Benadryl, right? It's most common. So a lot of patients will get an oral dose of Tylenol and they'll get an oral dose of diphenhydramine before they receive the medication, usually 30 minutes before it allowed to kick in, and it helps them mitigate a lot of those reactions. Some patients that we know have risk of reactions will actually get steroids beforehand as well. So they may get like a, a little mini dose of like hydrocortisone or methylprednisolone or something in order to help stave off any of those reactions, right? Sometimes they're getting the steroids because it's therapeutic. So I've seen some patients who would get like say a gram of methylprednisolone and then get their Remicade afterwards. So it kind of helps one, it helps prevent any uh, immune reactions to the drug, but it also helps as an anti-inflammatory just for the RA itself. Um, so sometimes patients just don't need that, right? What's important though, is if you have a drug that you know is a big risk for causing anaphylaxis, you wanna make sure you have PRN medications that are available should the patient have a reaction. Because again, you have these patients, um, oftentimes the providers, whether it's a PA, MP, or an MD, are writing these orders like say weeks or months ahead of time, and then your patient just comes back to the infusion center, they're scheduling it. So you're not necessarily there when the patient's getting the med. You don't want them to have a reaction, and then the nurse has to call you up, and you're at lunch, and so maybe you had your phone on silent, and meanwhile the patient's like, can't breathe, and then you know, the patient's dead, and you finally get to your phone, and you're like, well, why didn't you give them anything? And they're like, I didn't have any orders for anything, right? That situation would not normally occur, but that's the thing you want to watch out for. So you give them as needed medications in case they have a reaction, right? So what kind of meds do you think would be on that list? Some epi absolutely would be on that list, right? So they'd have an, uh, a dose of as needed epi. So it would say, um, you know, once PRN anaphylaxis would have you kind of notate that, right? What else could they get? Usually not a butyrol. Usually the epis are going to be pretty good to help out with that. But certainly that could be one thing on your to keep in mind on your list. What else? Hmm? Oh, not seizures. Or it's anaphylaxis. What else do you give an anaphylaxis? Give them steroids, right? So you give them more steroids, right? Because they're having a reaction, having an immune response, give them more steroids, right? So they'll have a dose of, say, methylpred or hydrocortisone IV, right? Normally they get meds as pre-medications orally, and then you'd have IV medications that they do have a true reaction. So maybe, you know, intramuscular epi, because that's usually how most often we give it. But IV, corticosteroids, and then what's the third med you'd want to give there, too? Anti... Histamine, right? You still give, you give more Benadryl, right? So even though they got 25 of Benadryl before they received the med, you still have a PR in order for like say 50 milligrams IV Benadryl because they're again are having an acute allergic reaction, right? Obviously, whatever they have on board is not enough to actually treat what they have. So those are kind of things you want to think about. Those kind of ancillary medications you have on hand just in case something goes on, so that way the nurse will know to go ahead and give them without having to necessarily wait for an order from you, right? So they'll certainly call you if a reaction happens, but they can act immediately without waiting for you, right? Anyway, so in general, the biologic DMARDs, um, very effective for what they do. They have pretty quick onset, though, but they are going to be uh, very expensive, right? So why are they so expensive? They're engineering proteins, right? They're mixing mouse and man together to make a drug. Like, it's hard work, right? So they're expensive, and, and a lot of times um, they we don't have a lot of generics for these necessarily. It's very difficult to even have a generic form. You'd have to have like a bioequivalent, and there's a lot that goes into it, right? So they're typically pretty expensive. A lot of times we'll actually have systems where we will um, have the, the medication companies, I might have mentioned this, where they'll actually have like systems to where we'll give them like maybe the first dose in the hospital for free, and then they'll work with the patient 
patient once they're discharged to get them hooked up for kind of continued therapy, right? Um, there's whole teams of people that just work on the insurance approvals to make sure that they can get their medications. Some people, that's their entire job. It's just to make sure people can get approved for the medication, they get it in so we can give it to them because they are so expensive. Um, um, the other nice thing here as well, very little monitoring. I don't have to worry about their um, their LFTs, their crabbing clearance. I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Their CBCs, when they're receiving these meds for the most part, because they just are very specific in how they're working, either blocking TNF or interleukin, whatever the case may be. But we do know that they have that risk for infection, risk for anaphylaxis, and you got to check for TB beforehand, right? Again, probably a lot of patients with RA, they're probably going to get screened for TB anyway, just as a part of the general workup, but it's something to certainly consider here as well. Um, in some cases, patients, if they develop an infection, they may actually want to discontinue therapy, but sometimes it may not really matter. You know, if they're receiving every four to eight weeks or so, it may be a while before that patient is going to get that dose anyway. And certainly don't give live vaccines because you do worry about actually getting that disease at that point. So in your TNF alpha inhibitor, so for the most part, you're going to see as a relative contraindication, remember CHF is going to be something you want to watch out for. We do see uh, there's a small increase in risk for cardiovascular death, specifically with like infliximab and etanercept, um, and you can actually see worse in exacerbation. So if they have a history of CHF, um, you do want to be careful, right? Especially if the lower their EF is, the more likely they are to have an exacerbation triggered by this. Again, I don't have a really good mechanism for why that occurs. It's just something they've seen in the clinical trials there. Um, and then some patients that have MS, um, they've actually found in some cases can actually induce or exacerbate their symptoms. So that's another relative contraindication uh, in those cases there. And again, another black box warning to go along with these is some small risk for lymphoproliferative cancer. But again, kind of weighing your risk versus your benefits. For the most part, the benefits are going to outweigh that, that small risk. So a tanner set, this one's actually kind of interesting because it actually will bind to, and if you actually kind of look at this uh, structure here, um, it actually looks like two TNF receptors, they kind of link together and then put onto an FC portion of an antibody. Uh, so kind of a novel mechanism is like, hey, here's your receptor to bind to, but it's like, psych, now I got you. And then your complement system will take it out, right? Um, so that's going to be a little different than the other monoclonal antibodies, which specifically just look like antibodies, right, with the full FAB and FC portion there. Um, Sometimes you'll find the biologics can be given by themselves, or they may, again, be added on to a non-biologic DMARD, one of the traditional DMARDs there. Um, again, if you can try to start your patient off with something easy like methotrexate and go along with that, it's a lot cheaper. Again, more monitoring associated with it, but it's usually pretty effective. And then add on something like this, or maybe if they don't tolerate maybe the methotrexate or any of the other traditional ones very well, then just go ahead and start with one of these, right? It's kind of an either-or sort of situation, depending on the patient's situation there. But again, cost of using this is roughly about $15,000 a year. So not the most expensive drug that's out there. Anyone know what the most expensive drug is? It's one we use for uh, spinal muscular atrophy. It's actually a, a virus that we have that encodes for a protein the patients don't um, make themselves. And that leads to this kind of uh, progressive sort of muscular weakness uh, kind of thing where basically they die of respiratory failure. Uh, we actually introduce that into the spinal column and then the virus infects their genome and makes them produce that protein. Uh, it's $2 million for a, a single dose treatment. That's, and then you get that once you're done. That's the most expensive. So if you ever felt nervous carrying something you're like, oh boy, please don't let me drop this. That's that's the one, right? I'm actually, <laughs> I've actually had to mess with that in a, on a, when it was still an investigational drug, we were doing that. I didn't realize how much it was going to cost afterwards. And I thought back on it, I was like, what if I drop that? Oh my gosh, like it would have been terrible. But anyways, so um, here you're going to see, again, the dosing can range for the drug. Sometimes, uh, for the most part, the, the monoclonal antibodies and, and the other biologics tend to have a pretty long half-life. They don't, uh, they'll stick around for a while. So I mentioned some of these you may be getting every week. Um, some of these may be twice weekly. Some of them you may get every eight weeks in some cases, depending on how you get with the maintenance dosing there. Um, but again, this one's going to be sub-Q. So this could be something conceivably that the patient's going to be giving themselves at home, either drawing it up themselves or injecting like with a pen. But keep in mind, if it's an older patient, they don't have any help, and maybe their RA's gotten so bad to where they can't actually manipulate the products anymore. Like, has anyone ever, like, manipulated, actually drawn something up in a syringe and injected it? before it, there's some there's a lot of dexterity to it there's a lot of um you know things that one goes into patient education but also can they even do it themselves right can they even have the wherewithal to do so um so that's something you want to consider i think in risk for infection obviously as i mentioned uh, before because again it's binding up all that tnf alpha so it's a harder time activating those um those receptors um 
with infliximab, again, this is a chimeric protein. This one's actually given via IV infusion. So this is one we have our patients actually come back every couple of weeks or so to come back and get their infusions for this. Um, again, beware, because it is chimeric, you're going to see a lot more of those infusion-related reactions. They're going to get that, you know, they may get a little bit itchy, they may get rash, they may get feverish, you know, with it, myalgias. That's where your pre-medications come into play, your Benadryls and your Tylenols to help kind of manage that. Um, a lot of patients are going to have issues with this. One thing you actually can see potentially is that by introducing this foreign protein, what is your body potentially likely to do? I mean, antibodies against that, which is why you would see maybe anaphylaxis potentially, but actually in, in some rare, uh, more limited cases, you can find those antibodies your body produces will then just inactivate the drug. So you can actually find less efficacy with it over time because your body is becoming immune to the immunosuppressant essentially. And so what we can do actually do to prevent that is give it with methotrexate, which is we know is an immunosuppressant by blocking replication of those white cells, preventing you know the, the from actually generating that immune response. So that's one way we can actually give the two together and that will help keep the efficacy of the infliximab for longer. This is more likely with something like infliximab because again it has more animal protein along with the human protein than something that may be more humanized, which we'll see with uh, a chimera in just a moment. Again, looking at the dosing strategy, I'm not going to ask you to know the dosing specifically, but again, just to illustrate that this one's going to be given less frequently because that's a pretty long duration of action. So, for instance, you may give it every, you know, say give it every two to six weeks at first, but then they can extend it out to maybe every eight weeks thereafter. So, you know, if they don't mind coming into the infusion center for an hour or two, get their medication, then go, and then they're good for two months, that may be okay for them depending on, on the situation there. Um, and usually we're going to infuse it over a couple hours, and that helps to limit that reaction we're going to get with that. What's another drug we saw, like a, a big infusion? Fusion reaction if you give too fast. Yeah, vancomycin is the other big one. Totally different mechanism there, right? So again, it's not the, um, like your body's having an anaphylactoid reaction to the vancomycin, but again, it could look kind of similar, right? It's not going to be that whole body-wide kind of rash like you get with vancomycin, but you know, kind of similar uh, theories there. Uh, then we have adalimumab or Humira. This is another popular one, mainly because this one actually has uh, comes in a pen form, so the patients could be administering it to themselves subcutaneously. Remember, um, in terms of education for injecting subcutaneously, what are some things you think you'd want to educate the patients on? Yeah, so, so it kind of circulates sites. Why would you want to do that? Scar tissue, lipodystrophy can actually occur at the site. What else um, do you want to want to do? Clean the area and also first wash your hands, right? So again, they're suppressing the immune system. You want them to get their cooties in, in to the injection site and then cause them to have an infection, right? So wash your hands, make sure to clean the site off. Usually they'll have alcohol um, uh, pads they can use to clean off the area and then inject and make sure they're circulating that around, okay? Um, but again, this one's every other week, so every two weeks, so pretty okay from a compliance standpoint from, from, from that. Uh, that aspect. Um, again, pretty similar adverse effects to what we saw with the rest of them. Less anaphylaxis risk, and again, that's why it's safe to give it home versus something like infliximab because it's all human protein, so the anaphylaxis risk is just so much lower. Uh, next, we have a batisep, so this one's a little bit different. This is a co-stimulation modulator. So basically, instead of working on binding up things like TNF alpha, this one's actually working to bind to these CD receptors on these T cells. And basically, it's interrupting the T cells from activating one another with that cell to cell contact there, right? So if you interrupt that co um, that co binding, you basically you prevent them from getting activated, you decrease inflammation. Um, still going to be a protein based product that has to be given via injection. Um, Usually you're going to find this is going to be for patients who maybe have failed a TNF alpha blocker. So, um, you know, I've seen a ton of patients on Remicade, a ton of patients on um, Humira. I've seen fewer patients on this one. It's usually kind of a backup agent. Some other ones I'm starting to see a little bit more frequently later on. Again, similar reactions, similar immunosuppression, nothing too different from that standpoint. Uh, next we have rituximab. So this one is actually sometimes you'll see it used for cancer treatment as well because it's actually good for certain types of uh, leukemias. This one will actually have as an antibody against CD20 and basically causes near depletion of your B cells, right? So B cells are going to get just kind of wiped out at that point. Um, and basically at that point the B cells can't produce antibodies uh, for the actual T cells to, to react with, right? Um, Basically, we're going to find that for several months afterwards, it's going to take a while for those B cells to actually recover at that point. And typically, not use first line, maybe as a backup if maybe they failed 
methotrexate, some traditional ones, maybe they failed some, some TNF, uh, TNF blockers there. Um, this one, because again, it's another chimeric protein, it has to, it has to be pre-treated. So you want to make sure you're giving that Tylenol, that Benadryl beforehand, maybe even some steroids beforehand to prevent that reaction, right? Um, this is another one you could use it along with something like methotrexate. Again, the combination makes sense. Biologic plus a traditional one, that's an okay combo. Uh, this is another one I'm starting to see kind of as an up-and-comer. I'm seeing a lot more kids that are being put on this from our rheumatologists. And so this is called Tocilizumab or Actemra. Again, for the most part, uh, if you're on rotations, just say the brand name if it's easier, right? Because you'll sound, you're going to sound silly if you try to say Tocilizumab and you screw it up, right? And these are very hard drugs to say in general. Um, so looking at this, this one's actually going to be binding up IL-6, right? So instead of going for TNF alpha, it's looking for a specific interleukin there. Um, and again, helps to normally interleukin will help to promote inflammation in RA by interrupting that process. Again, it's going to have similar effects to the TNF alpha blockers. Typically, if they fail the TNF blocker, then you can switch to something like this in those cases there. Okay. Um, some risk you're going to see with this is one, it can actually induce CYP3A4, so you have to be really careful because it can actually lower levels of other drugs the patients may be on, right? So for instance, if I'm they're on birth control and they are inducing metabolism of their estrogen, that can lower the levels, can lead to ovulation, pregnancy can happen, right? Or statins, right? You may have your LDL start to go up because you have less of your statins around. Uh, which statins in particular were affected by 3A4? Simvastatin was the other kind of big one you think about a lot. A torvastatin for sure, right? Like a torvastatin because of pretty high potency, but still 3A4 metabolized, right? Um, again, for the most part, low you know monitoring. I've never seen anyone actually develop uh, GI perforation because of this, but again, it's one of those things that gets reported, and so it's one of those things that can can happen. Should still educate patients on. Um, you'll find some patients may respond well initially to the biologic agents, but then it loses efficacy over time. It just depends on you know their the the course of their disease. In some cases, you may find the body itself is just mounting a reaction against the biologics and making them less effective. Um, so in some cases, you know, you can switch it up, right? So um, just because you have a, a bad reaction to infliximab doesn't mean you can't switch them to adalimumab. More often than not, though, you'll switch them from like a TNF blocker over to like, say for instance, a, a IL-6 inhibitor. That's why I see a lot of our kids end up being switched over to with Actimra. Um, you might, you may need to use a non-biologic plus a biologic, and that makes good sense, but you would never want to use two biologics together. So I would never see a patient who is on um, Actimra plus Remicade. You would never see that. The immune suppression would be too much, and they'd just be too big at risk for and not only you know, bacterial infections, but what else? Viral, fungal, all kinds of atypical kind of uh, bacteria or uh, pathogens, you know, just like AIDS patients and, and those on chemotherapy, and you know, like Mycobacterium avium complex and Pneumocystis carina, you know, all kinds of bad stuff you nor wouldn't normally see in patients with competent immune systems, right? So again, generally don't put biologics together. Uh, talking about corticosteroids briefly, um, again, we know they're anti-inflammatory, immunosuppressive. They kind of work on the entire process here, right? Less prostaglandins are going to be made, less leukotrienes, inhibiting free radical formation. It's going to do everything, right? Uh, very, very potent. And again, for a lot of patients, they'll be using either a sort of like pulse dose therapy where they're getting it as sort of uh, for an acute exacerbation. And then a lot of them may just be on chronic management with it, right? Just day to day there. Um, again, we know that um, there's a lot of side effects associated with this, especially with their older patients, right? So who am I worried about? What kind of patient will be worried about using daily corticosteroids in? Diabetics, Diabetics why? It's gonna worsen their hyperglycemia, right? Does that mean that I can't give it to a diabetic? That means you got to treat around it, right? Maybe I have to adjust their metformin. Maybe I need to adjust their glipizide. Maybe I need to adjust their insulin dosing, right? Um, who else am I going to worry about this in? Hmm? The other people that just are ha uh, happen to be immunosuppressed, right? Who else? What if they're postmenopausal? It can worsen osteoporosis, right? What else? They have glaucoma, right? This can worsen. Glaucoma can cause cataracts, right? Cause dermal thinning. I mean, lots of things that have come about from this corticosteroid, right? What does it do to your, to your mood? Makes you cranky, right? Corticosteroids make you cranky generally. Um, how about they have CHF? Water retention. Water retention. Weight gain, right? So again, you're gonna see all these things. So you gotta be really careful. It doesn't mean you can't use it in those patients. Just be cautious, right? Maybe sometimes you have to treat it around that, right? What can I do for a CHF patient who's having weight gain associated with their corticosteroid? 
give them more diuretics, right? Maybe out there, there what kind of dose, what kind of diuretic would I be using for a CHF patient? Carbonic anhydrase inhibitor? No, why not? Too wimpy, right? You would say that. Uh, I heard loop, loop, absolutely, right? What kind of loops would I give them? Throw some my what else? Everyone knows Lasix. What are the other ones? Uh-oh. Bumax, right? What's the generic for that? Bumetanide, right? Torsamide, or Demodex is the brand name for that one. And what's the weird one? Retochronic acid. Yeah, something, something acid, right? So. Preceptors like when you say something, something, nib. Like, mm, nope, try again, right? Remember, it's never a problem to say, actually, I don't know. Let me go look that up for you. But then what do you have to do after that? You have to follow up, right? There, You'll get so much more respect points for admitting you don't know something and actually following up than you would if you just uh, try to make something up on the spot. Because guess what? We can tell if you're trying to make something up. Anyway, um, uh, again, when do I have to worry about maybe tapering these patients? If they're on it for more than a week, right? A lot of patients may be on it for months, years potentially, okay? Um, what's the risk if I withdraw them too quickly? Adrenal insufficiency, right? Again, we're shutting down the adrenal glands because they say we got enough steroids around, we don't have to do our work anymore. And the atrophy, right? It takes time for them to kick back on, so may need to taper over a period of time, right? Um, one sort of thing to consider as well is like, well, maybe it's just a few joints that are being affected. Maybe I can do an intra-articular corticosteroid, things like triamcinolone, things like, um, you know, uh, sometimes, let's see what I'm trying to think of. Can't think of it off the top of my head, but usually um, triamcinolone is probably the most common one. Um, Kinolog is the brand name for that one. Um, again, good for fewer joints, fewer number of joints, uh, limit systemic toxicity in a lot of cases there. Typically, we don't recommend more than two to three doses in a year, mainly because you can actually end up seeing things like tendon atrophy, which can make tears and, and things, injuries to that more uh, likely, and actually can end up overall leading to further joint destruction. So they're very good. I mean, like patients who are like really having a really bad flare-up, if you give them an intra-articular corticosteroid, they're gonna feel so much better. They just can't get it for that, that many times in a year because of those problems. Um, so they're gonna want it sooner, but you gotta be like, man, I gotta, I gotta hold you off. I gotta, you gotta wait until you really need it, maybe a couple months from now or something. Um, typically, the lowest dose should be used, obviously. Um, and again, you're going to find that when using these, you can find actual radiographic evidence of slowed progression in, in those cases, or at least in the, the data that they have. Um, but again, we talked about all the side effects you're going to see with this. Uh, Got to be careful with these meds. Remember what to monitor for when they're on corticosteroids. Okay, so our NSAIDs, though, um, we know these are also going to be a good cornerstone of therapy for RA because they're going to provide good symptomatic relief. Do you think these are disease modifying at all? Not really, right? They just deal with the acute symptoms the patient's experiencing, but they're good as an anti-inflammatory, antipyretic, analgesic. Um, are NSAIDs generally reversible or irreversible inhibitors? Reversible. Which one's irreversible? Aspirin, right? So aspirin probably not the most common one you're going to see being used here. Um, are most of them selective or non-selective for cyclooxygenase one or two? Non-selective, right? So we'll talk about a few selective agents there. Have you gotten the talk from Dr. O about? COX-2 inhibitors. Yeah. For some reason, every single year, students always have a hard time being like, well, when can I use this one? When can I not use this one? When can I do this? If the patient has a cardiovascular history or they have a history of PUD. Uh, for whatever reason, I'm trying to make it clear this time around, but invariably, someone always has some confusion about it. And that's okay, right? Because again, it's a complicated topic. Um, typically, these NSAIDs for RA use a uh, kind of a baseline, can be used in OA as well, but again, remember there's going to be some chronic problems that can come about with this NSAID use we want to be cautious with, right? Um, again, only going to be for acute symptom management, but you'll still find them on it chronically just to help deal with those symptoms there. Um, now again, we're going to find that when we're talking about COX-2 inhibitors, when I say COX-2 inhibitors, what, what does that mean specifically? So it specifically blocks cyclooxygenase 2 only, or maybe has more of a preference for that, right? Selectivity is kind of relative, but it's more selective for COX-2. And what's the benefit of doing that? Right, I spare COX-1, which is responsible for doing what? Protecting the stomach, right? That's what's helping to produce that nice mucus barrier that neutralizes all those stomach acids, right? So remember, that's why we go with the COX-2 inhibitor for patients who maybe have a history of PUD or they're high risk for PUD. This is a good one to go with, right? What is the potential downside of using those? Why do we want to be maybe cautious with COX-2 inhibitors? Right, the cardiovascular risk, right? Uh, 
So there was like all this huge hubbub because Vioxx came out, Rofacoxib was the generic, came out and it was like the just the brand new hotness. It was just like, this is the best drug ever. You can give it to all your pain patients and it does great because they have no stomach issues with it. Problem was though, it was like a complete COX-2 inhibitor. did not it really spared. Um, uh, it was just COX-2 only, essentially. Very little COX-1 activity. And what did that lead to? Cause people to die, right? And it was basically cardiovascular death. And a lot of that had to do with the imbalance between the effects on things like prostaglandins and prostacyclins. It put you in a more prothrombotic state and inhibited angiogenesis. And so what you were seeing is the patients had a cardiovascular history. They're more likely to die from, from that. Okay, so because of that, they saw, and again, why didn't they pick it up in clinical trials? How many people are in clinical trials? Like say, um, uh, stage three clinical trials, how many people are included in those? A billion people? No. Millions of people? A million people? No, thousands, right? So you can't find one in a million side effects unless you give it to millions of people, right? So this is one of those things I didn't notice until it was in post-marketing studies, right? Because again, when do you participate in a phase four study? Everyone is in a phase four study the second you take a drug, right? Because we're still monitoring for these effects that happen. Uh, and so that's when they found these increased cardiovascular deaths above um, using a non-selective uh, NSAID in those cases. So that's why they ended up having a big recall and you saw like tons of commercials on there saying if you or your loved one have taken Vioxx, we can get you money um, because of that. So basically, if they have a high risk cardiovascular history, because well, you say, okay, well, COX-2 inhibitors are so bad, let's just never use them. But we can decrease that selectivity, maybe make it say, well, I have a little bit of COX-1 activity, but it's mostly COX-2. And that's where, what's our main COX-2 inhibitor we're going to mention? Celebrex, right? What's the generic? Celecoxib, right? So that's the one you can go with. And we found that it tends to be safe, right, from a cardiovascular standpoint. Um, mainly because it's has some COX-1 activity, but it's mainly going to be COX-2, so much limited, well, much less GI effects than you would see from, say, something like an ibuprofen or a ketorolac, something like that. Um, but you're going to find um, that there is that still theoretical risk. So if I had a patient with really high-risk cardiovascular history, maybe Celebrex isn't the one I'd want to go with right off the bat. But if they have a history of GI stuff, definitely using something like celecoxib, uh, uh, meloxicam is another one we'll talk about having some selectivity for COX-2. Those are all going to be beneficial for those type of patients. So really got to look at the history and figure out which one you want to go with depending on the situation, right? Um, again, kind of already went over this overall. What could I do if I had to use an NSAID, like a non-selective NSAID, but they're still having like stomach issues? What could I give along with it? And use something like misoprostol? What else could I use? Yeah, like a PPI or something that could also help mitigate some of that, that um, damage overall, right? Because I'm making less stomach acid, less things to neutralize, essentially. So that's another uh, thing you consider as well. So looking at our kind of algorithm here for, for uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis, again, typically starting off with a DMARD, most, li most likely methotrexate is going to be the one you're going to go with here, plus or minus prednisone, depending on kind of how bad their inflammation is right off the bat. Um, looking at that, depending on their disease severity, say it progresses or gets worse, or maybe the methotrexate by itself just isn't cutting, uh, cutting it anymore. This is where you can start to add on combination therapy, right? And you kind of have your options here, depending on maybe, for instance, what the insurance company is going to cover, maybe depending on what they've tolerated in the past, what their allergies are. So I could do something like a TNF-alpha inhibitor plus or minus methotrexate, or maybe use a non-TNF biologic, so maybe like an interceptor or something, plus or minus methotrexate, or tofacitinib. So again, any of these would be a fine option depending on what the patient can actually get, right? If they have, uh, maybe they fail uh, Remicade, they get infliximab, it's just not really working for them. Again, you can switch over to something like tocilizumab, right? Go with an IL-6 inhibitor, right? Maybe go with a Batacep in those cases there, plus or minus a methotrexate. That can always be a good add-on agent there because of its efficacy to toxicity profile there. Um, and then again, you're just going to try other stuff until you find something that really kind of works for that patient there. All the while, corticosteroids may still be a, a big part of that, that therapy as well. Um, again, if they fail a non-TNF biologic, uh, then you can again switch them over to another group there, again, maybe switch them over. If they were on a bad step, switch them over to tocilizumab, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and you kind of just keep going until you find something that works for the patient. There. It's pretty straightforward, right? Um, you want to ask what they've been on before, how to work for them, and then kind of figure out where to go from, from there. So, um, and again, looking at uh, combinations of traditional drugs, we would do this more frequently before we had a lot of the biologics, but you could do things like methotrexate plus hydroxychloroquine, right? Or you could do methotrexate plus sulfasalazine. Usually, methotrexate is going to be sort of that backbone of the, the regimen. You'll add other stuff onto it. 
probably wouldn't want to mix methotrexate and leflunamide, mainly due to risk for hepatotoxicity. That's one you probably wouldn't want to go with in those cases there, okay? Again, here's examples of, you know, um, logical ways to mix a traditional plus a biologic. I could do methotrexate plus infliximab. Um, you know, I could use maybe an, another traditional DMARD, maybe something like, you know, leflunamide plus adalimumab. That makes sense, right? Any of these would make good sense because you're modifying the mechanisms there. But again, no two biologics should go together. And tofacitinib, don't put with the biologic. Any questions on that? So switching gears, looking more at osteoarthritis, let's look at acetaminophen. Um, who do I got to worry about seeing in? Patients with hepatic disease, right? You got to be cautious with that. What's the max a patient should, a normal healthy patient should get in a day of acetaminophen? Four, Four grams is traditionally the max. That's a good number to know. I would recommend knowing that number. Whether or not it comes up on the test, it's just a good number to know. Usually if they have hepatic disease, you got to lower that. So some places will say like 30 to 50 in a day. Just say three grams, but you got to lower that because you do know that's going to increase their risk due to the hepatotoxicity that can develop from that. Okay, otherwise it's relatively safe. It doesn't really cause a whole lot of issues for most patients, which is why we like it. But overall, how does it work compared to an NSAID? It's kind of wimpy, right? So it's not going to be nearly as effective as you would see with some uh, NSAIDs. But you know, if it's mild pain you're dealing with, it's not too bad. Um, we could also look at things like topical NSAIDs can be effective for some of these patients. The benefits of using topical therapy is that it's going to limit systemic side effects, right? So if I have patients who maybe have failed oral acetaminophen, maybe they have high-risk histories where an NSAID is not going to be good for them, this is where I can use a topical NSAID here. Um, there are different varieties that are available. So for instance, there's like diclofenac, which is an NSAID, uh, comes as a Voltaren gel. Um, better for if you have a limited number of joints being effective. It's just the hands. Okay, you can do that. If it's the, the hips and the knees and the hand, it just, and the back, it's just, it just too much after, after a point, right? It's just too much having to apply all over the base the patient is like kind of bathing in it. It's not, not great from a compliance standpoint, right? There are some that are available over the counter though. You have things like salicylate-based products like Asper cream. Um, again, no big risk from systemic toxicity because again, it's just working right at the site where, where it needs to. Uh, capsaicin, so have you talked about capsaicin before? Give you briefly. So what is capsaicin? Most of my dates always carry some with them. Pepper spray. I'm just kidding. Um, not about the pepper spray thing, but I'm just joking about. Anyway. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so capsaicin is what makes pepper spicy, right? It's what makes, uh, you know, uh, basically it helps to sensitize things like pain fibers, those nociceptive fibers. It helps to release substance P from those nerve terminals, right? Um, so anyone know how you measure the spiciness of a pepper? Scoville, right? So the Scoville scale. Uh, I was watching, I went, you ever go down those YouTube holes where like you just end up, you just go from video to video? In weird, into weird places. Um, I found the uh, video about the guy who, I guess he's like from South Carolina, but the I think the current uh, record holder for spiciest pepper is called the Carolina Reaper. It's a pretty intense name. Um, and basically this guy, just he's like a botanist, and he just like, just breeds together different peppers until he gets them as spicy as possible. It's kind of interesting. Um, but anyway, you can actually use capsaicin topically, and we can use this to treat a variety of different conditions. Um, now, Capsaicin itself causes substance P to be released, right? I mean, like eating spicy stuff can, can be painful if you get too much of it. So, how do you think, why would this work for pain with osteoarthritis? Osteoarthritis. Because it actually will deplete substance P in the long term. So, if I use it consistently, basically your nerves will just run out of that substance P, and then your nerves will not be as sensitized to send those pain signals up into the brain. So it can be very effective. The thing is, they have to use it consistently, right? They have to use it around, you know, as directed, use it consistently. The problem is, like, initially, how does it, how does it feel? It hurts, it feels hot. Anyone ever, like, chopped up a jalapeno? You ever, like, your hands get, you ever get a little painful from it? You ever, like, accidentally, like, go right for your eye right afterwards? Like, you instinctively just, like, I don't know why I have to do this every time I cut up jalapenos. I have to, like, stop myself and... But yeah, it hurts, right? Because again, it's releasing that substance P. So initially, patients don't like it because it doesn't feel very good. It gets very, very hot, warm, painful, potentially. It does go away with time, right? As you deplete that substance P. So it's very effective, but how often do you think patients really stick with it? 
Not very, right? So that, that can be some problems. Um, but can be just as effective as some of our milder analgesics, good as an add-on as well. Um, you'll sometimes see this used, actually a brand name for capsaicin called Zostrix. Sometimes they'll use it for things like um, uh, shingles, like post neuralgias. neuralgias. It can actually help with some of that um, uh, neuro uh, neuropathic pain as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next section. Um, Anyone know what to do? Say, for instance, you do get, um, say, uh, pepper spray on you or maybe a hot jalapeno. You touch, you know, say, uh, mucous membrane is <laughs> really hot. Like, what do, you, what do you do about that? Milk. Or milk. Why milk? It's basic. It's basic? Yes. Hmm. Why milk? Because milk has fat in it. And capsaicin is quite lipophilic. And so by giving milk along with it, anyone ever watch Hot Ones on YouTube? What do they always give the, the people who are on there? A glass of milk, right? Because the uh, milk will be able to take up the capsaicin and release some of that heat there, right? Um, anything with fat in it will actually do. I actually had one patient who called up the poison center. She was chopping up uh, habaneros, I think, um, and she must have like, touched her thigh or something like that, and the thigh was just getting like really red and painful, and she would just call up. She was freaking out because she was like, in so much pain because of it. Um, and I was like, well, do you have any like milk in the house? She's like, no, I don't have any milk. And I was like, okay, well, you're cooking. Do you have olive oil? And she's like, yeah, I have olive oil. I was like, I want you to put olive oil on your leg. And she's like, who did I call? Like, why <laughs> I was like, trust me, calling 15 minutes, you're going to feel better. And so she did it. And sure enough, because the olive oil is lipophilic, it allowed for the capsaicin to come off and she felt a million times better, right? So again, fat containing things will always be helpful to get rid of that. Um, you know, I've always I've had strange calls too, or I've had like a family was going on a camping trip and bear spray is essentially like a milder form of pepper spray and the kid was playing with it. And guess what happened? went off in the car so everyone was exposed. Um, <laughs> ocular irritation is a really big one, so again, a lot of flushing, a lot of water for that kind of stuff. I wouldn't pour milk in your eye. Um, <laughs> might not feel very good, but definitely a lot of flushing, tap water and whatnot. So that's, that's how you manage that stuff normally. Anyway, off of that tangent. Uh, other things you can use as well, things like camphor, oil of wintergreen, they kind of act as counter irritants and they kind of can work similar to how capsaicin is to some degree. Um, again, maybe not quite as effective, but usually you know, it's over the counter kind of remedies. Patients might have tried it already. Um, as I mentioned with intraarticular corticosteroids, not to be administered more than say three or four times a year because you do worry about tendon atrophy and things like that. Um, can be good for patients with OA, especially if it's just like say one or two joints being affected there, especially like in the hips and the knees can, can be pretty effective. It definitely provides some good pain relief. Now in terms of opioids, Typically, you don't want to jump to opioids for patients with osteoarthritis. You want to do the physical therapy and do all the other things before you jump to opioids because what's the problem with opioids? Addiction maybe. What's the other thing that's more likely to happen? Constipation, but physical dependence is the thing we're going to talk about. I'll talk much more about this in the next section. Um, but really, there's no good evidence to show that opioids are going to be beneficial in the long run, right? And if anything, they tend to be somewhat more debilitating in the long run as opposed to helping you get more function back as we'll see. So we'll look at some, some downsides to that later on. We'll get much more into that. Um, has anyone ever heard of glucosamine and chondroitin before? Yes. This is technically a dietary supplement. Um, actually comes from a couple of, of sources I'll mention there. Um, but glucosamine and chondroitin are stuff we find in our own joints actually. And it's actually found in, in synovial fluid and whatnot. Um, the idea is by taking this, it's thought to help kind of regenerate a little bit of the joints there. Maybe it slows down progression a little bit um, against one of those things where it's probably not going to do a whole lot of harm maybe somewhat beneficial. What's the downside of using an herbal supplement in general? Yeah, who regulates herbal supplements? Themselves, right? So there's no oversight from the FDA unless there's reports of like harm actually occurring to people. So for instance, I always think about like when you guys have heard like OxyCut, or I think it was a HydroxyCut. It was like a dietary supplement that was used for like weight loss and actually they had a product uh, that was uh, causing a ton of like hepatotoxicity. FDA came in and made them recall it. Um, so unless something like that happens, uh, FDA didn't really care, right? They just say, well, it's not really in our purview. Uh, you got to do whatever you want. So what does that mean in terms of like when you look at the label or one of those things? What's in the product might not be what's on the label in, the, in some cases, right? So again, sometimes what you pay for can, you know, you get what you pay for in some cases there, right? Um, so I definitely tell patients if you're gonna use a, a dietary supplement, stick with a reputable brand, stick with one consistently, you're more likely to get sort of consistent effects from that. Um, again, this is not gonna like totally turn around and maybe prevent a patient from using, you know, you have to get a knee replacement, but it, it may help out to, to some degree, mild, mild effects. Um, relatively safe for the most part. The one thing you wanna be careful of is uh, shellfish allergy. So some of this actually comes from uh, shellfish base. And so if they have an allergy, they could cross react. So you definitely wanna watch out for that one, okay?
But anyway, um, you know, probably most study in, in knee osteoarthritis, and again, not going to be something that's going to hurt your regimens. No big drug interaction, so it's relatively safe to use as long as you don't have that allergy issue. Uh, next up, hyaluronic injections this is actually where we can inject the joint itself to try to replace from that hyaluronic it's losing. Um, and so also it's nice because it actually has some anti-inflammatory properties as well. And so it actually helps with mobility. It helps with reducing some of that pain there and usually dosed every three to five weeks or so. Uh, and as some patients will get this as sort of a, um, a bridge therapy until they get their, um, you know, joint replaced. I know like, for instance, my mother had really big issues with osteoarthritis, especially in the knees, a terrible pain associated with that. Um, and she had all kinds of other medical conditions to go along with it. So she w really had to get all that other stuff in place before she was healthy enough to really get the joint replacement, right? So in the meantime, though, they can give her hyaluronic injections, help out with the pain, help out with mobility a little bit until they kind of tipped her up from the other standpoint, and then she got the, the joint replaced itself, right? So it depends on how you're going to be using that in an individual setting. And again, I'm just looking at this, uh, you know, again, in terms of flow, again, start with the easy stuff first, start with the acetaminophen. Most patients are going to tolerate that pretty fine for the most part. Um, and again, if they are not contraindicated, you know, maximum four grams a day, but consider all sources of where they're getting that. If they're getting opioids that contain the acetaminophen, you got to factor that into it because it's a really easy way for patients to overdo it. And then they're coming in, they're yellow from head to toe, and you're like, oh boy, you got way too much Tylenol. You even know what the antidote to Tylenol toxicity is? Never seen it. Oh, it's the N acetyl. N acetyl cysteine. Perfect. Yeah, very good. N acetyl cysteine or mucomist or acetidote. <laughs> he takes after me. I don't, you know. <laughs> what can I say? No. Um, yeah, N acetyl cysteine would be the, the antidote to that. Um, so anyway, so again, four grams a day, less though if they have a, a history of hepatic impairment, right? Um, other than that, consider topical NSAIDs, especially if it's like knee only, that tends to be pretty effective there, intraarticular corticosteroids. The main thing you're trying to keep them away from is getting to the point where they need opioids, right? If you can keep them off opioids, that's gonna be beneficial for the most part, just because of all the other problems that come about from that. And obviously surgery, if the pharmacologic methods are not working there. Um, in some cases, patients have had benefits from using things like duloxetine, which we'll talk about more in the behavioral section. It's actually an SNRI, a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. We'll talk more about that later when we get into like neuropathic pain issues. Uh, for hand, you can find it, it'll be a little different. So for instance, um, you know, if they're greater than age 75, this is where you worry more about using oral NSAIDs because of the fact that, you know, there's issues with not only their, their stomach being an issue there, they have bleeding risk. What happens with the kidneys and NSAIDs? Tell me forgotten this. Remember the efferent and the afferent arterioles we spent so much time talking about? Remember the bad drawings? Remember the times we had? <laughs> Remember that prostaglandins keep that afferent arterial open in the glomerulus, right? If you get rid of those NSAIDs, or get rid of those prostaglandins with an NSAID, it's going to clamp down. It can cause acute renal insufficiency, right? That's why you want to be careful when older patients and NSAIDs can cause renal failure in them potentially. Anyway, see how that works. Um, you know, again, if it's hand uh, osteoarthritis, things like capsaicin can be really beneficial. Topical NSAIDs like Voltaren gel, try that first and see how that works for them. We'll talk about tramadol in the next section, so that's going to come up a little bit later. It's kind of like a semi sort of opioid product we'll, we'll make mention of. Um, again, things like intraarticular corticosteroids may not be as reasonable. Hyaluronic injections may not be as reasonable just because of the number of joints that could be actually affected there. There's a lot of little ones, as you know. Um, so again, just depends on how they're really going to be responding to that. And again, unfortunately, we don't have hand replacements or we can do we're just not there yet right although if I could get like mechanical hands that would be pretty sweet I think I would jump out for that um, okay so I can get started I got some, a little bit of time here yeah, a little bit of time. nine minutes I mean I technically got till 430 so I can keep going all day long I choose to let you go at 420 when I do I can go much farther if I'm just kidding. Um, I try to respect your time, so you respect my time, right? So it goes both ways. Um, uh, yes, I'll go ahead and cut it there. So we'll we'll reconvene. <laughs> I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you, uh, let's say, a 16-hour break, and then we'll reconvene uh, at 8 a.m. and we'll continue on. Any questions on this? Look how generous I am. I give you a 16-hour break. Oh my goodness. No additional questions. I will see you all tomorrow bright and early.